So Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse just released and it's really good, like overwhelmingly good. Like I can't say everything I need to say in a single video kind of good. Everything that was great about the first movie, this movie takes it and steps it up. The animation is more gorgeous than ever. The soundtrack is incredible. Each character is so layered and complex. There's so much happening in every single frame that it's impossible to get the full experience on just one viewing. But there's one thing that everybody's been clamoring about more than anything. The one thing that above all else has become a cultural staple and will forever remain as this movie's legacy, the Spider-Verse Whopper. I had it earlier today and you know what? It's not that bad. You know, I'm not really into Whoppers or anything, but it's not the worst thing I've ever had. And Oh God, I should really start cooking from home more. And that's why this video is brought to you by HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes straight to your doorstep. It takes the hassle of shopping and meal planning out of home cooking and turns it into a fun and affordable experience. Enjoy the convenience of whipping up a restaurant quality meal right in the comfort of your own home without having to spend hours at the grocery store. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and takeout, making it a win-win for your wallet and your taste buds. Whether you're a busy individual or a family with picky eaters, HelloFresh offers a variety of delicious and healthy meals to choose from. You can customize meals by swapping, upgrading, or adding proteins and sides with calorie smart or carb smart options. And if you're short on time or you're like me and you just, yeah, just cooking takes way too long most of the time, you'll love the quick and easy recipes, ready in less than 30 minutes and still packed with flavor and filling portions. HelloFresh sources its ingredients from the farm to your doorstep in less than a week, ensuring that you always receive fresh, high quality produce. Cooking with fresh ingredients not only tastes better, but can also provide you with more nutrients and a better overall eating experience. If you love snacking, HelloFresh has got you covered with a wide range of snacks desserts, sides, and more at HelloFresh Market. Simply add your favorite goodies to your weekly order and they'll arrive at your doorstep along with your meals. Sign up today using my code or the link in the description and try out HelloFresh for less stressing and more savoring meals. And thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. This video has spoilers for Across the Spider-Verse, by the way. Uh, I, I, I figured that was obvious, but uh, there's your warning. Okay, cool. The movie is gorgeous. Like, oh my God, it's beautiful. The first movie was groundbreaking with its animation, developing new techniques and inspiring animators all over the world to try new things. And this movie just steps it up even further. No amount of live action budget or CGI or studio interference could ever be capable of creating even a fraction of what this movie accomplishes visually. We're seeing firsthand how artistic freedom and love is able to impact a film directly and how that quality and that passion leads directly to box office success. By the way, a uh, shout out to Daniel, who was working at the AMC and recognized me for of the channel. Uh, he sold me that popcorn bucket. Uh, you were really cool. I'm sorry I was weird. I was really tired. Now, the question that a lot of people are asking is, is this better than the first one? The two movies are so radically different from each other with how they approach the story and the themes. I see that first movie as something cozy. It's kind of like my comfort movie. And this one took a lot of those same ideas and challenged them in really interesting ways. The first movie was a true lightning in the bottle, perfect in every single way. And so I really appreciate that this movie didn't try to recapture that. It didn't try to rehash the leap of faith scene. It didn't overdo it on the callbacks. It's more nuanced and layered than the first. And I really I really appreciate that this movie didn't try to set out and replace the original and instead do its own thing. The structure of this movie is really interesting to me, which is funny because last year I made a video breaking down the story structure of the original Spider-Verse. The first movie is what I would call the perfect hero's journey, down to the plot beats and the character archetypes. It's perfectly paced and structured by the standards of what we know about traditional three-act storytelling, and that's why it's such a solid, cohesive experience, and why I've rewatched that movie over and over again. In the video I talked about, actually, actually let me just show you. You got all that? Okay, cool. So when I first saw Across the Spider-Verse, I was a little put off with its pacing and its structure. I initially chalked that up to it just being part one of part two, that the movie just wasn't finished and therefore it would be really hard to talk about. The concept of two-part movies is something that you can bait all day. On one hand, it's kind of unsatisfying to have a movie end halfway through the story, but on the other hand, I think it can build a good amount of hype and allows for bigger, grander stories that otherwise wouldn't be possible in the medium of film if it's done well. The difficult thing about two-parters though is that they have two jobs to do. The first is to be the first half of a larger five-hour movie that can be viewed in one sitting, and the second is the still be a cohesive story on its own. The midpoint is usually the part where the story feels like it's starting to get going. It's called the point of no return. And so to end a movie there, right when it feels like the ball starts rolling, can put a lot of people off. Thanks so much for watching everybody. If you like this video, be sure to like button and subscribe. So if you break down a five hour movie into a three act structure and split it right down the middle, you have to somehow break up the story into another three acts without messing up too much about the big picture. And I initially wrote the movie off as just that, part one of two, and that it was the best first half ever made. But then I saw it again and again, and then a bunch more times, like too many more times times, like I think I have a problem more times. And it was on each subsequent rewatch that I started to peel back the layers of what Across the Spider-Verse was trying to do as its own movie, and I started to love it more and more. Not just as the first half of the best Spider-Man movie ever made, but instead as its own cohesive story. Yes, it's still a part one and the quote-unquote main plot isn't finished yet, but there's still plenty of fulfilling character arcs and story decisions without the concluding half, and I think the movie has its own unique themes and identity that let it stand apart. A lot of people will say that the movie is fulfilled because it's actually not Miles' story, but instead it's Gwen.
ends. But I don't think it's that simple. She definitely has a strong arc and it's an important part of the movie. But to me, Miles is very clearly still the main protagonist. He has more of an impact on the plot and the world around him. And he shows a bigger change throughout the story. Gwen isn't the main character just because she's at the beginning and the end. But she is clearly a textbook example of a deuteragonist. I didn't say that right. I know I didn't say that right. Instead, when it comes to this movie structure, I think that it's broken up not into three acts, but into essentially five acts. A prologue on Gwen's world, act one with Miles in 1610, act two following Gwen to Mumbatton, act three fighting the Spider Society, and an epilogue that wraps up Gwen's story and Miles gets trapped in the wrong dimension and sets up for the third movie. If you break up the movie like this, the overarching story becomes a lot more clear and the movie stands on its own a lot better. Although I absolutely understand how that cliffhanger ending would be frustrating to some people, mainly because that reveal is just so good. So Miles uses the machine to go back home, but because the spider that bit him was from Earth 42 and not Earth 1610, he got sent to the wrong dimension and is trapped in a world without a Spider-Man, where Uncle Aaron is alive and his father is dead, and he meets Kilometers Immoralis, who's the prowler of this universe. This twist is fucking sick. I love everything about it. I especially love that when the spot is giving his monologue about the spider, we see it get taken from Earth 42 as it's about to bite that version of Miles Morales. It's a blink and you miss it moment, but I think it's really cool when you notice it. This twist begs a whole bunch of questions about the nature of this universe and this version of Miles, and I'm really excited to see that get explored. If you ask me, despite how often Miles is put in these big multiverse stories, we don't see enough alternate versions of him, so I really like that. It also ties this big grand story of the Spider-Verse back to Miles and the characters that are unique to his origin. I've seen some people say that the 1610 version of Miles was supposed to become the Prowler before he got bit, and they're using this scene where his spider sense changes from green and purple to red and blue to signify that change, but we've seen the spider sense change colors all the time, and I don't think that his version of Aaron would let something like Miles turn into the Prowler happen. The entire first movie, he seems ashamed of his life as Prowler, and he's adamant about not letting Miles fall in those footsteps. And so I'm really interested in Miles 42's backstory and why he went down this path, especially since he was originally supposed to get bitten by the spider. Without a Spider-Man in this world, it seems like crime has run rampant, and that's probably led to a different upbringing for this Miles. Not to mention his accent is more Spanish because he spent a lot more time with his mom after his dad died. Also, I think it's really cool how the Earth 42 Miles is voiced by a Dominican actor, which is a callback to the joke at the beginning of the movie. I've seen some people suggest that this version of Miles isn't actually a bad guy, and instead of becoming Spider-Man, he uses the Prowler mantle to fight crime. And while that would be interesting, he's clearly doing some nefarious shit, and also he's gonna blow up Miles' head which is crazy. His different upbringing and the world around him has most likely led to him having to look out for himself more. And I feel like that's gonna be a main factor in the third one. In the same way that Uncle Aaron didn't realize he had a choice, neither does this Miles. And 1610 Miles could maybe help to redeem him and let him be the Spider-Man equivalent of his universe. And speaking of Spider-Man equivalents, what good would talking about this movie be if we didn't mention all the different spider people and cameos that we saw? Cause apparently that's what you're supposed to do. When the second trailer came out, I looked through the background and pointed out as many spider people as I could, but there's some new ones that I think were neat. Of course, Yuri Lowenthal makes a quick appearance as Insomniac Spider-Man using the actual model from the games. And we even see Genki playing a snippet of unreleased gameplay from Spider-Man 2. So I guess there's a whole video just on that because I'll forever be a Spider-Man channel now at this point and I just got to accept that. Also, they call him video game guy. So now the Insomniac Spider-Man knows he's in a video game from now on and that opens up a whole can of worms that I don't even want to get into. Also, you bet your ass I'm buying that collector's edition. It's gonna be the coolest shit in the world. It was really cool that Charlotte Weber as Sun Spider got a cameo. She's a great character and a great concept and a relatively new addition to the comics. So I didn't expect to see her be in this, let alone have a speaking role. And I couldn't not talk about the Lego Spider-Man sequence. The fact that this whole thing was animated by a kid in his bedroom is genuinely incredible. His name is Preston Mutanga, a 14 year old who Lord Miller reached out to after he recreated the trailer in Lego. And he made it in his spare time while in school using Blender tutorials on YouTube. This kid is a legend and it just shows how accessible learning art and animation has become nowadays. Also, the scene's just really funny. Josh Keaton reprises his role as Spectacular Spider-Man, something that I would have been really excited for if it hadn't been ruined for me at literally every possible turn. Why did they do that? Why can't I just go to a movie not knowing everything about the movie? I just want to be surprised. But I was really happy to see him back though. Keaton's always been my favorite voice for the character. And I think it's great that we got a little snippet at the rest of his story with the death of his version of Captain Stacy. Some people are saying that this means it's more likely we'll get a season three, but honestly, I don't really think so. If it happens, that'd be really cool. But at this point, I'd rather either a spiritual successor or some kind of comic storyline as opposed to a full-on revival, since there's always the risk that it won't live up to expectations. Donald Glover made a cameo as an alternate universe prowler. This moment was fun for a lot of reasons. Firstly, it was nice to see his version of Aaron Davis because God knows we're never seeing that guy again in the MCU, but also because Glover has been so tied to Spider-Man and Miles Morales that it's more layered than just a simple cameo. Back before Andrew Garfield was cast as Spider-Man and before Miles Morales even existed as a character, Glover was one of the biggest fan casts for Peter Parker in the movies. And when he was on Community, they decided to reference that a little bit. You can even see this scene being shown in the background of the original Spider-Verse. And because of this scene and the campaign of Donald for Spider-Man, Brian Michael Bendis was inspired to create Miles Morales in the Ultimate Universe. Glover ended up voicing Miles in his first animated appearance in Ultimate Spider-Man and is why he plays Miles' uncle in Spider-Man Homecoming. And so this little cameo just adds another layer to that story and I really like that. But the funniest part about this is that 
Donald Glover exists in Miles' universe. They were literally watching Community in the first movie. And so the reason he's staring so much and acting so weird is that he's seeing a version of his dead uncle from another universe who looks eerily similar to world-renowned actor and multi-platinum recording artist Donald Glover. And I think that's really funny. Also, I saw them use the death of Uncle Ben from the Amazing Spider-Man 2 game. I, you're not slick. I caught that. I, I'm far too familiar with that scene. The thing that I liked the most about the cameos, though, was that they felt earned, if that makes sense. Like, Spider-Man is undoubtedly the most popular superhero in the world, and so a lot of people know him and they know their shit when it comes to the character and his mythos, to the point where even more casual fans are pretty familiar with a lot of the big characters and events. So it's really refreshing that this movie went with a lot deeper cuts for its references and its cameos. There are the big ones, of course, but I had a lot more fun with things like Web Slinger and Widow, Spider-Rex, Peter Parked Car, Video Man, because those are such weird and different polls that they were clearly done by people who know and love the character's history. The cameos aren't done just to get the audience to clap now, please, but instead to celebrate all things Spider-Man in all different forms of media. And that applies to the story references too. A huge driving force of this movie has to do with the death of George Stacy, even referencing the original comic of Amazing Spider-Man issue 90. Captain Stacy's death is a huge deal for Peter in the comics and is arguably one of his biggest mistakes, yet it's only ever been adapted once so not as many people are familiar with it. The movie very easily could have made it a reference to Uncle Ben or Gwen or Harry Osborn or something else that's more well known that's been beaten to death over and over in other media. But instead, a main driving factor of the story is a pull from the source material that feels like actual thought went into it and like it was made by real lovers of the character, not just people who looked it up on Wikipedia. And I really like that, especially since it ties into Miles really well and how we know him from other media like the PS4 game. And that's not even to mention the inclusion of Peter B. Parker as a father with his baby Mayday. Don't talk to me about the comics, I'm begging you, don't, do not talk to me about the Amazing Spider-Man comics right now, I swear. In the complete overhaul of Spider-Man India, who ended up being one of the best characters in the movie. But my favorite Spider-Person, and by far the one that I was looking forward to the most, was Hobie Brown as Spider-Punk. I love Spider-Punk in the comics, even though he hates being called Spider-Punk, and I love him even more here. I love his design, I love the way he's animated, I love the way he's written. I love Daniel Kaluuya's portrayal of him. Everything about this character is just incredible. At first, he seems like just a fun side character, but he has so much nuance and depth and brings so much to the story, even with how little screen time he gets. My favorite thing about him is that they build him up as this sort of semi-antagonist. They make you think that there's going to be a love triangle and that he and Miles are going to be at odds with each other, that he's some kind of cocky asshole that's going to put Miles down, when in reality, it's the complete opposite. We see that he's truly a genuinely nice dude and is fully supportive of Miles. He just met him and has his back better than Gwen or Peter did. He tries warning him that the spider society isn't all it's cracked up to be, that he should be his own boss and make his own story. He even hypes up Miles after he saves Inspector Singh on the bridge and allegedly disrupted the cannon. He's almost like a big brother to Miles, which is especially interesting since the 616 universe of Hobie was the original Prowler, and that relationship builds over the course of those few scenes, and so when he helps Miles escape and is happy to see the chaos that he's causing, we're 100% on board with him and it's satisfying. And as a character, Hobie represents a fundamental part of this movie's core messaging. This movie puts a lot of emphasis on the cannon, with Miguel and his spider society desperately trying to keep the multiverse together by maintaining canon events in different spider people's lives, whether that's a spider bite, the loss of a loved one, or the death of a close police captain. Now, this is a very in-your-face meta commentary on how a lot of people treat Spider-Man media and comic book adaptations as a whole. This idea that certain events have to be followed down to the letter or else they shouldn't exist. It's a discussion about the idea of comic accuracy and allowing artists to break free from the molds that are set by the source material. And not only that, the way that Miguel treats Miles, saying that he's an anomaly, that he doesn't belong with them, that he shouldn't even exist, is a direct commentary on the people who still haven't been able to accept the character of Miles Morales as Spider-Man. I would try to break it down and explain why I think that, but, uh... Was there any degree of that story that was meant to be a sort of commentary on the fans who, who don't see Miles yes. as a real Spider-Man? Yes. yes. There's a huge amount of hypocrisy and inconsistency when it comes to Miguel and his mission. If Miles is such an anomaly because the spider that bit him was from another world, then what about Mayday Parker? She was born solely because Peter met Miles, who is so-called the original anomaly. Does that make Mayday an anomaly too? And if it does, why is Peter's Earth perfectly fine? And the same with Miles' Earth in Earth 42. I'm seeing a lot of people debating the concept of the canon. And based on what Miguel says about the multiverse and the rules that were laid out, try to rationalize Miles and explain why he still exists without his universe collapsing and break everything down and try to make sense of it all. And frankly, I think people are reading a little too much into it. Miguel is wrong, plain and simple. He's the antagonist saying that Miles Morales shouldn't be Spider-Man in the Miles Morales Spider-Man movie. Of course he's wrong. In the flashback, Miguel tries to interfere with a universe that he doesn't belong to by changing a story he isn't involved in. We're led to believe that this is the reason that the universe breaks down, but we don't get the full story and we never see that the idea of canon events are real, only simulations done by an algorithm. And this is further shown at the end of the movie with Gwen's dad quitting the force, no longer becoming a captain and disrupting her canon event, and yet nothing happens to her universe. As for the big hole that opened up in Mimbatten, maybe that's because of the collider that fired two minutes before. You know, the thing that the first movie said was 
was going to destroy the multiverse. Or maybe it has a little something to do with the guy whose body is made up of holes and can make more holes. Oh my god, I haven't even talked about Spot yet. Jason Schwartzman is fantastic at Spot. They turned this joke of a character into someone genuinely interesting and terrifying. And also, Miles. My guy, did you learn nothing from the Lego Batman movie? If a weird guy shows up and says he's your nemesis, just go along with it. Whether Miguel just misunderstands the multiverse or if there are outside forces at play here, that's something we can only know when the third movie comes out. But fundamentally for the story to work, the whole idea of the canon is supposed to be questioned and challenged. The canon is meant to be a representation of the limitations and rules put on the character of Miles by everyone around him for him to break out of. The movie even uses this when it comes to the structure and the story. When Miles learns what he's supposed to do and breaks away from it, the movie itself breaks away from that traditional structure and goes in a completely different direction. Not only does this set up really well for the next movie, but it's also a really interesting meta decision that's probably not intentional and I'm reading too much into it. And the movie itself doesn't even stick to the canon of the Spider-Verse comics. I really love how this movie and the last Spider-Verse movie, while still clearly being a love letter to the character of Spider-Man in his comics, doesn't feel beholden to and limit itself because of that source material, namely with how it handles the Spider-Verse concept compared to the comics. The Spider-Verse comics are fine. There's nothing wrong with them and there are some enjoyable aspects. They've done a lot in terms of introducing new characters to more readers and just the concept of having a bunch of Spider-Man interact is fun. But in my opinion, they've always been bogged down by so much lore and complicated cosmic ideas that it muddies up the stories a lot. Like the idea of spider totems, inheritors, Morlin, the great weaver, the master weaver, the gatekeeper, the other, the bride, the scion, the pattern maker, all stuff that has potential to be interesting, but it's a little more out there than a lot of people might be into. It's part of why I prefer how the 90s animated series and Shattered mentions handled it. Too often it feels like comic accuracy is used as a crutch, a justification for the makers of these adaptations to not be as creative as they could be and not introduce interesting ideas because, well, that's how the comics did it. And that's not to mention that it can sometimes ruin the experience for comic fans because there's no more surprise. And now there's a comparison to be made with the source material. And so it's really refreshing that the movies seem to be completely disregarding all of that. There's no mention of Madame Web or the totems or the extra dimensional vampires that eat spider people, which now that I'm saying it out loud sounds like a much cooler concept than it is. The most we get is a passing reference to the web of life and destiny, and that's it. Instead, these movies take the concept of the Spider-Verse and boil it down to its most important aspect. What if spider people from across the multiverse teamed up? There's a certain simplicity to these movies and how it handles a big concept like the multiverse, and that simplicity lets the movies use these concepts to emphasize their characters and their themes better. And that's not even to mention how the first movie completely went and did its own thing when it came to Miles' characterization and his origin, to the point where a lot of that bled over into the comics with the newest run, which is really good. Miles' comics are good now. I'm tired of this narrative that Miles' comics are bad. They're really good. They've, they've always been pretty good, but they're especially good now. One of the things that I thought was interesting is that of all the spider people that seem to be the main defenders of the canon, at least the ones that are heavily prominent and marketed a lot, Miguel O'Hara, Jessica Drew, and Ben Riley, all three of them don't have your traditional Spider-Man origin. Ben Riley is a clone of Peter Parker. Jessica Drew had a spider implanted into her by Hydra. Miguel O'Hara got his powers from a forced lab experiment. Hell, he doesn't even stick to walls or have spider sense or even shoot normal webs. He's about as far from traditional Spider-Man as you could possibly be. And so I think it's so interesting how he of all people is so adamant about this canon to the point that someone like Miles, who by and large does have that traditional Spider-Man origin, even down to the death of his uncle, shouldn't exist in his eyes. I wonder if that's intentional and if their insecurity about their own accuracy to the canon is why they work so hard to keep it intact. I do think it's interesting how different Miguel is from his comic counterpart. In the comics, Miguel is anti-authoritarian, anti-corporation, anti-capitalism, anti-establishment. It's really cool. I love him. He's the best. And so to see him in this movie being the head of what is essentially a massive multiversal police force set on upkeeping the status quo is kind of strange. I think it works for what the movie's trying to do, and in things like Edge of Time, Miguel has been characterized as someone who prioritizes the many over the few. Maybe he started out like his comic counterpart, but then after the death of his family, he went down a different path. Or maybe in the next movie, we'll meet the actual comic version of the character, maybe even wearing a black suit for once. Please, I am begging you. By the way, the co-creator of Miguel O'Hara, Peter David, has a GoFundMe right now for a life-saving surgery he needs. David is a legend in the comics industry, and he's so close to reaching his goal. So I ask anyone who's able to, please try and help out as much as you can. There will be a link for it down below. Some might say that the decision to have all these different Spider-Man, including Spider-Man that we're familiar with, like Peter B. Parker, Insomniac, and Spectacular, all side with Miguel on this and decide that Miles has to let his father die is out of character for them. And I understand that sentiment. This is a whole ethical dilemma that superhero media discusses all the time, the many versus the few. In Spider-Man's entire moral code is, if you can do something to help, you have the responsibility to do that. So just deciding that Captain Morales has to die for the fate of the multiverse kind of goes against that. And I think that's the point. This spider society in general seems like a flawed concept. The idea of the solo act hero who started out when he was a kid, sneaking out of his Aunt Mays every night, joining a society with thousands like him in some militarized strike force with the intent on upkeeping a status quo is clearly something that we're supposed to challenge. I also feel like not every one of these spider 
people knows all the explicit details of how this operation works. Like, you really mean to tell me that the popsicle Spider-Man is going to force Miles to let his father die? What's his canon event? What's the what? And Miguel has to handpick each of these members, so maybe he's specifically ignoring some incarnations and choosing others at times when they'll be the most emotionally vulnerable. To use Spectacular as an example, yes, it is somewhat out of character for him to be just cool about someone's dad dying. But think of it this way. This version of Peter has been through absolute hell. He just lost one of the only allies he's ever had in his life, and it's all his fault. And so this idea of the web of life and destiny and the canon serves as a comfort for him. Reassurance that not everything in the world is his fault, and that there's a reason that things like that happen. And maybe some of these Spider-Men have grown a little bit too comfortable, and that means they've eased up too much on what it means to be responsible. Either way, I don't think that they've had their character assassinated or anything like that. And I think the majority, if not all of these spider people, will see the error of their ways and rebel in the next movie. It's okay for these characters to make a mistake and grow, and if you ask me, it's honestly refreshing to see these kinds of cameos be framed in that kind of light. Miles' story is fundamentally about acceptance and conformity. For the entire film, Miles is completely alone as Spider-Man, not even getting any help from Genki, who he's normally tied to the hip to in other media. He wants desperately to be around people that understand him and accept him, and everyone in his life is trying to force some kind of narrative on him. The movie is filled to the brim with allegories and metaphors, and there are a ton of different ways you could read into this, but I see it as a pretty overt allegory for life as part of a marginalized community. It says a lot about being a young black man, being mixed Latino, and me personally, I saw a lot of similarities to life as a queer person. All right, cool. A whole bunch of people just clicked off the video and that's why I did that after the ad. Miles and Gwen struggle to tell their families their secret as Spider-Man parallels the struggle of coming out to your parents as a young person. Superhero media with the teenage secret identity always has those undertones. That's just a product of the archetype, but this one felt really heavy handed with how it went about it and the wording choice that it used. Now you might be saying, oh, Troy, you're reading too much into this. This is just a Spider-Man movie. It isn't that deep, but you're really gonna sit there and tell me that the movie that constantly keeps saying, I'm worried that they won't love me the same and I don't know if they would get it. And Gwen talks talks about hiding half of who she is while her hair looks like the colors of the trans flag and bisexual lighting fills her entire room is all just a big coincidence? You're really telling me there's nothing to that? Like not even a little bit of intent went into all that? Happy Pride Month everybody and if you're even a little bit of an asshole in the comments I'm gonna come to your house and kiss both your parents on the lips. I see some people saying that Gwen as a character specifically is trans which I think would be a really interesting direction for her. I personally didn't get that reading based on what the movie was trying to do and say but I think that it's a perfectly valid take to have and that it doesn't hurt anybody even if it's not true. And if you didn't get any reading while watching that movie, that's perfectly fine too. But part of the joy of storytelling and the subjective nature of art is applying your own personal worldview and experience to any story. That any allegorical reading of a character is entirely valid. And so if there are trans people who found Gwen's story to represent their own, then I say the movie succeeded and that's a good thing regardless of what's canon. Although Miles does talk a lot about doing both, so. This whole thing is all subjective and up to interpretation, and that's just my personal bias when it comes to this sort of stuff. That was a joke, everybody laugh. I bring this up because when you apply this kind of allegorical lens to the movie, either a racial lens or a queer lens or whatever allegory you think fits, the messaging and the themes of this movie become even more clear. For his whole life, Miles is told how his story should go. Whether that's his parents or the school advisor or Miguel, they're all telling him what direction his life should be going and never letting him stray from that. The school advisor even makes up a story as a struggling immigrant family without even knowing him. And so when Miles joins the spider society and sees that he still wouldn't be accepted unless he followed their rules and let his father down, Die, that's when he snaps. The spider society into the canon is more than just a meta commentary or the representation of toxic fandom, but a stand in for anyone and everyone who accepts you in your identity so long as you fit what they deem as acceptable. Gwen is willing to be part of this club and help maintain this canon if it means she can escape the troubles of her own life, but she learns that she was never accepted by them, that she was never valued for who she was, because the second she steps out of line, the second she doesn't do what she's told, even after betraying her only friend in the multiverse, she's kicked to the curb and sent home. Do I think Miguel, the character, is racist and homophobic? No, it's an allegory. That's how allegories work. But he represents those things. This movie asks the question, is it worth it to be accepted if you have to conform to do so? Is it worth it to be loved conditionally? And Miles' entire story is realizing that and loudly and proudly saying, absolutely fucking not. And so that's why Miles' relationship with Hobie is so satisfying. It's why Miguel's insistence that he shouldn't exist hurts even more. It's why it's so gratifying when he breaks away from the canon, betrays the spider society, and goes against the status quo. And why it's so heartbreaking when even his best friends don't support him. Each and every time I rewatch this movie, I feel like I'm peeling back a layer as to what it's trying to do. Not just as part one or half of a movie, but as its own movie with its own story to tell. And that story is fundamentally one that challenges the worldview of the unaccepting. The people who say, I like Miles as a character, I just don't think he should be Spider-Man. The people who say, I don't care if you're gay, just don't do any of that around me. The people who like your videos, but can you please not get so political. The people who decide someone's life and identity don't matter because they lost the privilege. When the peaceful protests become just a little too inconvenient 
inconvenient they label them riots. When the status quo is even a little bit challenged, when even the slightest amount of progress is about to be made, the ideas are shot down and labeled extremist. The movie says you should never have to conform to be loved, never have to behave to be accepted. And if there's anyone in the world who doesn't accept you for who you are, who wants you to abide by their made up archaic rules or else decide you shouldn't exist, you just tell them, nah, I'ma do my own thing. Holy shit, I love this movie so goddamn much. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. If you liked this video, be sure to like button and subscribe. Special links to 21 Escalators, Also the Sting, Anne's, Already Done It, Codemaster, Cabbage Boy, Cassidy, Chicken McDoofus, Cosmic Tragedy, Dan the Dreamer Shill, DJ Ricky 08, Eden Kenna, Iron Ninja, Jake Selig, Jonah, Lime Spice XL, Spectacular Clyde, Tim Newfeld, Troy's by Erasure's Lame, Tyler Goodrich, Josh Kapoor, Zachary Stonebreaker, and Zero to Hero 148 for being Spectacular Fanboys on my Patreon. This has been Troy Boy 17 coming at you live. Be responsible. Happy Pride Month, everybody, and I'll see you around.